Hi, and welcome to our review of Marvel Champions. Or, if you're watching in France, bonjour, je suis Marvel Champignon. Marvel Champions is the newest living card game from Fantasy Flight Games, a form of collectible card game that's basically like Magic the Gathering, but with no booster pack lottery. Each player takes on the role of their favorite Marvel character and together, cooperatively or on their own, battle the villain of the day. Or in my case, instead of a favorite character, I get to take on the role of a poor compromise because FFG hasn't published Daredevil yet. Just going to sit here and stare at you until you give me what I want, which is Daredevil. Wow, FFG have just announced a new Daredevil character. Really? No, I just need you to move on to the next scene. Marvel Champions is one year old. Happy birthday, and has already become a crowd and critical darling. Ask anyone who's played it, and they'll at least have something kind to say about it. And when I played it, when this game was released, I was not impressed, but this wouldn't be the first time that I wasn't smitten with a core set of a card game to only see it blossom later. So I waited for a year before publishing anything editorial, and now that a whole bunch of extra packs and a big box expansion has been released, I can lay my cards on the table. To borrow an analogy from Marvel, this game feels like the Infinity Gauntlet but with like two gems missing. It's got reality, because it exists, obviously. It's got time, because you know, time has passed. It's got space, because there's a storage solution for the cards in the box. And it's got mind, because this is a smart game. But it lacks power, and it lacks a soul. What I'm trying to say is that Marvel Champions is like a soup, where someone put in a lot of cool ingredients, like tomatillos, but to extend the soul analogy, forgot to add chicken stock, or any kind of spice. But I don't think that my verdict is nearly as interesting as why I feel like that. But first, let's examine why so many people love this game. Let me be not at all the first reviewer to say that if you want to do some kapowing, then this box has at least 20 cars and perhaps double that amount of pows. It's a box of kapow pows. Even the core set itself features some fan favorites like Speedy Man, The Iron Bucket, Lucy Lawyer, Captain Copyright, and Catman John. Not enough? Well, in the last year alone, the roster of playable characters has expanded to Miss Marvel, Captain America, Black Widow, Spider Woman, Hawkeye, Thor, Doctor Strange, my favorite, and the Hulk. I haven't got the Hulk pack, but if you just imagine me green, honestly, we're 80% there. Every time you play, you'll also select a villain, and that will determine the scenario you'll try to overcome. Play against the green goblin, and you have to figure out how to avoid his pumpkin bombs while simultaneously dealing with his criminal empire. And if you play against Rhino, then you have to figure out I don't know how to de-rhino him. I really don't like Rhino. When you play cards, they resolve into pretty typical collectible card game things. For example, the Captain America deck is based all around assembling. A lot of your cards will be allies. You'll pay their cost, plop them on the table, and they'll stick around, kicking the villain or thwarting their schemes. But you also have upgrades like Cap's shield or events, which are one-time effects like punching a Nazi villain in the face. I guess what I'm trying to say is, don't miss your opportunity for this one-time event. So far, feeling very uninspired, right? Well, here's where Marvel Champions gets really cool. Each of your heroes has a hero form and an alter ego form, and they can flip between them once a turn. First up, you want to flip between each side because certain cards can only be played or activated when you're in that mode. For example, Steve's Apartment, and yes, Steve's Apartment is an actual card in this game, just run with it, can only be activated to heal one damage and draw one card when you're in the alter ego mode, aka you're being Steve Rogers. Now let's talk about the friction. Let's talk about the tension between the mechanisms and the objectives of the game. Let's talk about the rubber dub dub. 
That did not feel right. Each villain you face has a hit point total that's divided into two phases. If, say, you're playing on the normal difficulty against Ultron, you'll have to defeat Ultron 1 by dealing the requisite number of damage to his hit points, then you'll advance to Ultron 2 that has some upgraded stats, once again more hit points, eat them up, and your winner winner chicken dinner. Again, all of this seems like pretty typical card game stuff until we get to how you lose. Each villain has a main scheme deck. Some villains just have one single main scheme card, others have two or three cards tiered in the same way as their hit point cards. Each turn, threat gets put on the current scheme card. If there's ever threat equal to the scheme's limit, you have to advance it to the next stage where something nasty could happen. If you ever fill up the last card of the main scheme deck with threat, then you have lost the game. That's where the hero slash alter ego mechanism really comes into play. Once you and your friends are done playing cards, it's time for the villain to act. And in addition to drawing cards from the encounter deck and resolving various bad things like treacheries, which are once again one-time effects, except this time they are bad for you, or side schemes, which add extra schemes towards the table, or even minions, which is just extra things that you need to kill, the villain will also attack. But whether the villain will attack your hit point total or add more threat to the current scheme depends entirely on whether you're respectively in hero or alter ego form. And thus you're web swinging in a constant seesaw of decisions. Do you blast yourself into hero form so that you can attack and reduce his hit point total or you can even thwart and reduce the amount of threat that's on the current scheme therefore managing the situation or do you just chillax into the alter ego form where you can Tap your card to heal some hit points, draw some extra cards at the end of the turn, which are also resources that you use to pay for other cards. I know that sounds confusing, but it's actually pretty simple. There's just some resource symbols at the bottom of the card, and then you spend those to play the card that you actually want to play. In its best moments, Marvel Champions doesn't offer a clear answer. Each decision has downsides, and you're backed into a corner. No matter what you do, there will be consequences, and most of the time, you're the weaver of your own fate. That's the thing you see. Mechanically, Marvel Champions doesn't have a lot of fault. Sure, it's swingy, but thematically that works in its favor, and I could perhaps dent it for the game continuing when one player has been eliminated, an egregious mechanism in a four-player game, but that's it. However, start picking this game apart conceptually, and it leaves you more wanting than the time you went to see Thor The Dark World in the cinema. Let me walk you through my experience of playing the various scenarios in Marvel Champions. First, I faced Rhino. I had to manage my friend, but I dealt him damage, and once I dealt him enough damage, I defeated him and I was done. Then, I faced Claw. Now, Claw was a little harder. I had to manage my friend, whilst I dealt him damage, and then when I dealt Claw enough damage, I defeated him and I was done. Then I had to face Ultron. Now Ultron was really difficult and it took multiple attempts and there were extra complications whilst I managed my threat and dealt him damage, and then when I dealt him enough damage, I defeated him and I was done. Okay, I thought, that's just the core set. There'll be more scenarios released as villain packs. So, I got the Green Goblin pack that came with two scenarios. And once again, I had to manage Shred whilst I dealt with complications and dealt the villain damage and I was done. I'm oversimplifying things slightly. There's some interesting things going on with modular sets that change up each scenario, additional side schemes that create extra conundrums, and even personal nemeses that are tied to whatever character you're playing that pop up from time to time if you're unlucky. But the narrative tenor of each adventure feels identical to the previous one. Now, this might be an odd critique, but Given the context of FFG's previous cooperative LCG, Arkham Horror the Card Game, it makes a lot of sense. I'm by far not the only reviewer to make this comparison, but I feel like Arkham spoiled me. Each scenario felt like a narrative journey, with many twists that 
bulldoze the foundation of the rules you're familiar with to reshape them into a unique experience with each new pack. Whereas Marvel Champions doesn't feel so much like it has a story and more like, hey, here's a boss defeated in the established framework and you can change stuff up with modular things if you like. Side note, just because people are going to ask, yes, we're still working on part two of the Arkham Horror video. It's just a long project, it takes a while. I've got nothing against a good boss fight, but when you consider that the Marvel Champions theme is born out of a narrative medium and the Arkham Horror franchise is synonymous with you constantly facing a big, stupid boss, I can't help but feel like the design ethos of these two games should have been flipped. I am treading on dangerous ground here because the advocates of this game love it for how it handles the theme. The constant flip-flopping between duties as a mere mortal and a paragon of power. The mechanical idea in each deck, representing the character's tropes and arsenal. But I don't think that's where theme comes from, because as soon as you try to extract it from text on cards, rules or flavour, you inevitably run into the problem of the whole thing devolving into nonsense. Imagine a four-player game playing the introductory scenario from the core set with the starting characters. In what world would you need Iron Man, She-Hulk, Black Panther and Captain Marvel to stop Rhino, the narrative stopgap that comic book writers use to pad out the story until they get somewhere more interesting, from robbing a bank. Even in a single player game, one of these characters would be way too much effort for this footnote. I think it's rather telling that the winning condition for this game is you just running the villain out of hit points. Tell me, have you ever read a good superhero comic book arc where the story ends with the good guy just defeating the bad guy by beating them up. The great thing about superhero stories is that they have capabilities far surpassing any average human, but it's never enough to succeed. To overcome great challenges, they use compassion or empathy or friendship, all of the best values of human greatness. Basically, the thing that makes them super is not their superpowers, but that they embody the best of us. They're more human than humans. And when they fail, they fail because of greed or ambition or hubris. Again, human qualities. And Marvel Champions arguably represents some of that with the alter ego mechanism, but within the scope of gameplay, that's mostly used to just recover hit points so you can get back into the fight and beat the villain down again. In Amazing Spider-Man issue 700, Peter Parker wins by dying. His mind is swapped into Doc Ock's failing body and he realizes that the only way he can win is by turning Doc Ock into a hero because his fate is already sealed. Whether you like that story or not, you can't argue that it isn't an excellent example of superhero narratives being weird, different and creative. And when I think about how that story would play out in Marvel Champions, I can come to only one conclusion. It can't. Let me tell you about a game I've played as Doctor Strange against the Green Goblin. Normie here has a mechanism where much like heroes, he flips to his alter ego. When he's Norman Osborn, he gains power by doing shady business through Oscorp, but you can't directly deal him damage. When he flips to the Green Goblin, he'll whack you harder than you can imagine. There I was, ragged and beaten down on my last ounces of health, but suddenly things started coming together. I would magic blast him, stun him, and then he couldn't attack. Power Fist would leap at him, stun him, and then he couldn't attack again. Magic Blast after Magic Blast, I was wearing him down. And then, I kid you not, the Avengers main theme started playing on my Spotify. He was down on one hit point, and all I had to do was turn my card for a basic one attack punch, and he was done. And can you guess what happened next? Nothing. Because there isn't anything next. Nothing to wrap it all up, no narrative denouement, no satisfying conclusion. Can you imagine how disappointing that feels? Marvel Champions deviates from other living card games because when you buy a new character pack, you're not just buying some new cards, 
you're buying an entire new concept. Each pack does have some new cards to toy around with, but primarily you get a whole new pre-constructed deck that's playable as soon as you take the wrapper off. They created the laziest collectible card game ever, which is great! I don't have the time in my life to fiddle around with new decks. I can just open one of these and play. And it makes sense given the setting. If you treat Marvel comic books like escapism, they shouldn't inspire hard work. They should feel like a warm blanket, ideally with Kapow written on it. But just because a game is breezy, it doesn't mean it can't be exciting at the same time. If I'm going to invest my money into a collectible card game, I want to feel a dividend of greatness. I want a reason to invest. And so far, the only reason I found is that this game has Kamala Khan, and sadly, no other game does. Marvel Champions has existed for a whole year now, and it's had nine packs and an entire expansion box packed with goodies. There should be enough ideas here to really indulge in creative deck construction. Now, I'm sure seasoned, dedicated fans of this game are going to disagree, but after I dabbled with deck construction, I just went back to these pre-constructed decks because nothing I made was exciting enough to warrant the effort, which again isn't an indictment. Like I said, I like that this is a lazy game and I can just open up a pack and play. I'm just left with one question. Why is this a collectible card game? Whether it's character packs or villain packs, I don't think the cost of these justified what I got out of them. Whereas the Red Skull campaign box is the complete opposite. Five scenarios and two new heroes for the cost of two of these packs, plus an entire campaign structure to play through all of it? How does that add up? Because there is an actual campaign arc tied together with some of the corniest comic book artwork since Rob Liefeld entered the scene, scenarios start to feel like they deviate from the standard formula, because what you do in Adventure 1 might affect Adventure 3, or even Adventure 5. I'm not sure I jump at recommending Marvel Champions. It's a fine game, but it doesn't add up where it counts. Yet, if you really like Marvel, if you like Marvel so much that you don't mind dropping a blob of money on a chocolate Santa with no filling, then I would recommend getting the Rise of the Red Skull expansion to go along with the core set, and maybe, maybe a hero pack if they made one of your favorite characters. I'm fully aware that I've just skewered this game for not being what I want it to be and just being something else instead, but I don't think that what it is is that exciting either. Does it innovate on collectible card game formulas? A little, but the same can be said about every single LCG Fantasy Flight has released. And that's the thing. In vacuum, this is a very decent game, but it's from a company that can do more and has done more consistently. And I'm not one of these people who's snooty about superheroes either. I know this game is beloved and I know this review will probably leave some people upset because it unashamedly wants more and asks for more. But I don't think that Marvel Champions tells a good story. Heck, I don't think it tells a story at all. All it lets you do, and I'm not saying this is a bad thing, is play cards and make pretend that you have superpowers. Which brings us to today's sponsor, Skillshare. I'm not gonna tell you that Skillshare is gonna give you superpowers. That's only something Bruce Springsteen can do. But they do offer thousands of classes on various subjects from visual stuff like photography and graphical design to practical skills like organization. For less than $10 a month, you can find out information on almost any subject delivered to you by industry professionals. This is why Skillshare is great. I bet over the course of your life, you filed away all these things at the back of your head that you wanted to learn. And they don't necessarily have to be big things. Maybe you just wanted to be better at tidying up, or maybe you just wanted to learn how to brew a cup of coffee. Well, Skillshare can teach you all of that. I'm no chef, but I love cooking. And one thing I know I was never any good at was chopping stuff. So I typed in chop into the search bar and there you go, a whole class on how to be a master chopper by Ilana Karp. And look at me now, total success. For a limited time, you can use the link in the description of this video to get a free trial of Skillshare and learn anything you want to learn. 
No Pun Included is made possible by our Patreon backers. Without you, we could never do this. So thank you so much. This week's Patreon shout out goes to Pierre White. Pierre, I rang up Bruce and whilst he's all out of teleportation and flying, he said he's still got telekinesis so he can expect a parcel in five to seven working days. Although do be aware that parcels with superhero powers fluctuate in the quantum realm. So if they disappear out of existence, that's not really my fault. 